Welcome to the week 4 session on designing. Slide 2. The intended learning outcomes of this session are to discuss and evaluate our design processes and the approaches we use to explore um, student-centered methods, active methods for our lectures and our face-to-face -face sessions in order to maximize student engagement and hopefully we'll introduce some technology enhanced uh, curriculum design processes as well to add in there. So on slide three, first of all we have to ask ourselves the question what is the purpose of higher education and the purposes are many and in fact different people believe it is for different things. So the suggestion here is that the, the common purposes we have is about disseminating knowledge, it's about developing capacity in our learners to use ideas and information. It's about developing students ability to test their ideas and, and use evidence and test evidence to generate their own ideas, to generate their own evidence and getting into research, doing their research. Uh, the purpose is all about personal development and professional development. Um, and also maybe to develop the, the capacity to plan and, and manage their own learning. But as I said, different people often believe different things. For example, the government often sees it in economic terms and sort of future knowledge economy jobs and contributing to the tax base and so on. So it can be very, very tricky. So when we're thinking about planning our sessions, designing our sessions, we need to keep in the back of my mind what, we, what the purpose is of, of what we're trying to do. And I think one of the key purposes, obviously, uh, in higher education is to help students learn. Students arrive and they don't always know how to learn effectively and, and we need to help them here. And we can do that through giving them experiential learning opportunities, through collaborative learning opportunities, by giving them support and guidance, by giving them activities that allow them to process information, that apply information by structuring our lectures, by structuring our modules and courses and so on to help them learn. Crucial of course is to give them feedback on their learning at appropriate time and we'll talk more about this in week six. We can help them through the resources as well that we give them and we talked about that in week three. So moving on to slide five then this teaching and learning cycle, so we've got the uh, starting at the identifying the needs and the planning, moving into the designing, facilitating, assessing, supporting, evaluating and going through the cycle again. So obviously today we're focusing in on the designing. So slide six, what is a good aim? Now this should be about where we start. It's about what we are trying to do, what we are trying to get across so the students are clear about that. When we move on to intended learning outcomes, this is flipping that idea of the aim on its head. And this is about what learners need to be able to do as a result of our lecture, our module, our program, and so on. So the aim is what we're going to do and the outcomes are what the students can do as a result. Slide eight. So a well-written learning outcome will include active verbs. It's about students doing something. They need to be able to do something. It will identify the, the important requirements. So it will be those knowledge, those skills, the attitudes that we expect from the, the module. Obviously they need to be achievable and measurable. Now measurable sounds uh, obvious but sometimes we don't actually measure the learning outcomes that we set out to measure. We measure something else and measuring outcomes is always a challenge and again this goes back to setting our assessment tasks so that they line up properly with our learning outcomes and I'll talk to this later. Make it into clear language. Let's get rid of really horrible terms and overly complicated academic language. Write it in clear language so that students clearly understand what is expected of them and make that in terms of explicit statements of what they're expected to achieve. On slide 9 then, we are looking at the content and the intended learning outcomes. And when we're designing, we need to think about what is essential. 
So we might see the essential as the basics of the topic, the things that we co we're we definitely going to cover in our teaching sessions. And this also may link to threshold concepts, those key concepts that we have to get across that are fundamental to the module, the topic, and so on. Then moving outwards into the should, these are the broader, deeper knowledge and understanding. This could be directed reading, this could be activities, tasks, online and so on that we might introduce in our lectures but maybe not go into great detail. And so maybe what we should say is that the essential and the should, if students know all that then they should do well. The could obviously gives us further breadth and depth and I think for the really high flying students we need to provide something for those. And then the nice is pretty much everything in the subject. Um, but, you know, the focus should be on the essentials. What are the essentials to get across? And, and then direct them to the should as well. We also need to think about the different domains of learning. So we have the cognitive domain, which is about knowledge, intellect. We have the effective or the emotional domain, um, which is about maybe our emotions, our values and so on. We have the psychomotor or skills domain, which is about physical movement, physical skills, manipulations, and so on. And also we have this interpersonal domain, this social domain. It's about learning inter through interaction with each other. And if we take the cognitive domain, Bloom created a taxonomy to break that cognitive domain down into different levels. And so at the bottom we have this knowledge recall level. And you build up sort of sophistication through comprehension, being able to apply, analyze, synthesize, and evaluate um, knowledge in the cognitive domain. And in the 1950s, Bloom found that about 95% of the test questions used to assess student learning actually only required them to think at the lowest level, this knowledge recall um, level. And so this is why he developed um, this taxonomy to include these higher level thinking skills. And if we look at them in more detail on slide 12, we have knowledge is about defining, memorizing, recognizing and so on, recalling information. So we can use any of those terms in our learning outcomes as well. Comprehension then is about maybe explaining uh, a bit more. Application, obviously, be able to apply that that knowledge, that comprehension. Analyzing to be to appraise, to calculate, a little bit more sophisticated, maybe to criticize. And then being able to synthesize lots of different ideas, collect different ideas from different areas of a subject and bring them together in a synthesis. And then finally to evaluate, to appraise and judge ideas. And so if we look at literature um, in the field of, of learning and teaching, you know, do we believe in the theories we read about? We need to evaluate them. So when we go back to our learning outcomes and using Bloom's taxonomy, we want to avoid using terms uh, on slide 13 on the left-hand side. Things like know and understand. What does that mean? We, we think Actually, we do this all the time. We use know and understand all the time, but what do they really mean? And I'll give you an example. I know that the sky is blue, but what does that actually mean? I can tell you as a fact the sky is blue. I could probably explain some of the physics vaguely around why the sky is blue, but does that mean I know the sky is blue? Does it mean I understand that the sky is blue? What do I actually mean? mean? Better would be to say, you can describe that the sky is blue, or I can explain that the sky is blue, or can I evaluate the reasons why the sky is blue? Now that's much more specific and measurable in terms of what we expect students to be able to do. And later on in uh, this century, Anderson and Crathwell reconfigured Bloom slightly, um, changing the, the wording and changing some of the orders a little bit. So at the bottom they have remembering through understanding, which was Bloom's uh, comprehension, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and they changed the top one into creating, creating new knowledge, and so on. So to summarize the first section of this, 
what we're talking about is the notion that Biggs introduced um, in the, the core textbooks for this module was constructive alignment and that is about aligning our learning outcomes with our teaching activities and assessment activities so they're all aligned to do the same thing with the same purpose so that the learning and teaching activities are designed to meet the learning outcomes the assessments are designed to meet the learning outcomes so we know that students construct meaning from what they learn this is what this principle is based on and so we need to make sure that us the teacher aligns all these different elements together so that we create something that's achievable for the students and if we write our learning outcomes in terms of what need, students need to achieve um, and make sure our assessments fit in with that so it's really worth going in and looking at this concept in Biggs's um, book so how do we put these ideas into practice well first of all on slide 16 Knowing your students, that's very important, that can help. Um, build in variety, have active approaches, really think about assessment for learning and, and the feedback. Acknowledge contributions, be creative and be flexible. So on slide 17, when we're actually planning our sessions, some of the things we need to remember and consider are the learners, the size of the group, the title, the time duration of the session so obviously longer sessions we need to include more activities more breaks the day and date time location that may affect how students learn if it's early in the morning we might need to do something to wake them up if it's just after lunch we might need to do something to to wake them up a bit obviously the aims and the learning outcomes we've been talking about we've got to think about how we're going to structure it we need logical structure in terms of our content let's think about the methods, the activities we're going to use in our sessions, even if it's a lecture, we want some sort of activity in a lecture. What aids, what resources we're going to use, what is the assessment, how does it all link together? And some other things to think about is differentiation. You know, some students are more able than others, some students know the subject more than others. So do we have some of that built in that we can stretch the more able students without losing the uh, students who are struggling a little bit more? And obviously we need to reflect and evaluate on our sessions. So delivery, and this is what a lot about the course is about. We've got our traditional delivery methods. We've got our lectures, our seminars, our tutorials. I'll leave out labs and practical sessions at the minute. I'm really just going to focus on this delivery aspect. So what do these mean? And do we deliver them in a certain way because they are called what they are called? Do we deliver a lecture simply because we were given a lecture slot? So the question is how, how do these labels affect how we plan our sessions and how we plan to deliver them? And of course, what can we do about it? Now what I want you to think about is the notion of moving from transmission to actually thinking about the reception of the message. In other words, is it more important that we transmit our content or in fact is it important that students receive the content just because we stand up there and talk about the content doesn't mean it's going in doesn't mean to say that students receive it in the way we think they are going to receive it so it's about focusing on how we get our students to receive and in this sense I really mean process absorb learn the content and how we can facilitate this process so it's about moving away from this didactic transmissive mode and thinking about different approaches to facilitate learning to get the students to understand what we want them to understand to be able to do the things we want them to do so different approaches could be used we've got problem-based learning which is often used in health settings there's individualized instruction now don't confuse that with one-to-one -one tutoring. Individualized instruction is giving students working through certain things at their own pace. And a good example of that is the, you may be aware from the news, the, the Hole in the Wall project that started in India, where the young kids work through materials on the internet. There are things like podcasts. Rather than uh, give your lecture, like we're doing with this session, record it 
get people to students to listen to it and then in the session the lecture session work through some of the key uh, points of the lecture so there's lots of different ways we can do it but the key message here is that students have to be actively involved in their learning and learning that content and that's through the tasks we provide to help them to deliver that so thinking about what we deliver and thinking about our content what content going back to this idea the essential the should the could the ideas about threshold concepts and of course widening it out of the cognitive domain into the skills the psychomotor and so on and I just want to talk briefly about threshold concepts on slide 22 a lot of research has been going on recently that certain concepts are held to be central to mastery of a subject. So they've looked at this in maths, in science, in economics and so on. And good example in mathematics, um, calculus is a really fundamental mathematical principle without which you can't do all sorts of things. If you don't understand it properly, you can't do it, you can't move on. Um, so Threshold concepts tend to have these six features. They're transformative. In other words, once you get it, it changes the way you see a subject. They're often troublesome. They can be counterintuitive. Often that's, that's very common in, in science subjects. Um, so sometimes the student struggles to understand their normal understanding of a term versus the discipline understanding of a term and again very common in economics as well they're usually irreversible once you know it once you've done these things once you can do whatever it is that you're expected to do on these threshold concepts you're not going to unlearn it you're not going to go back to a state where you you didn't know what it was they're integrative in other words they bring together different aspects of a subject um, and sometimes students see subjects in very compartmentalized ways and our modular structures do not help that but actually threshold concepts are these concepts that really tie the subject together and we as experts can see that it's obvious but students don't they don't see them necessarily the links that we see being because we're the experts in the subject threshold concepts are often bounded in other words they delineate one concept from another concept so they often sort of are a topic in themselves and they're often discursive in other words a student who un can do whatever it is or feels confident in this threshold concept it enhances their ability to talk about the subject they use the language of the discipline much more comfortably now that they've understood this really key concept. Moving on to our final selection section on curriculum design, slide 23 and then 24. The curriculum is normally a creative act, but we usually focus on doing it the normal way. We focus on the core knowledge of our discipline, we focus on assessment, whereas uh, maybe a creative curriculum should focus on the spaces, the learning spaces, about being flexible, about originality, about personalization, I mentioned about individualized instruction, and about collaboration. And really the question is, do we value creativity in our departments? Do our students value creativity? Do we, as academics, value creativity in our actual curriculum design? And on slide 26, there's a, a useful um, cycle, the curriculum life cycle from GISP, which sort of takes you through a very simple model of from approval of your curriculum through the delivery stages and then into the evaluation and maybe development or redevelopment. And also when we're thinking about the curriculum on slide 27, when we're designing it, when we're planning it, there are various different stages. We've got, well, what's our rationale? What are our aims and learning outcomes? We've talked about those. What are our content? We've talked about those. What are our teaching methods? What is our assessment? 
But let's also think about what's the environment, what support do learners need, what management and administration issues do we have when we're delivering our modules. And obviously we've got to plan in evaluation and review of our modules and go back to the beginning again. Slide 28. We also need to remember there are external and internal influences on our modules, on our sessions, on our curriculum. And these could be professional bodies, they could be resource implications, there could be a particular skills agenda or, or employability agenda we need to consider. There are also influences in terms of the students in areas like widening participation and also technology and the expectation of technology in our classrooms is increasing. And then there's also the research element uh, and in terms of what do we know about learning and how we can bring that in and this is what this course is about. And thinking about the overall student experience and there's a lot of research going on at the moment into the student experience of higher education, especially with the recent pressures of the Brown review, uh, increasing tuition fees and so on. It's useful to think about curriculum design models on slide 26. There are different ways of constructing curriculum. We have this idea of modules with certain credits and that can sometimes limit but even within that structure there are different ways of doing it. There are maybe scaffolded models like the Lego model where you get a basic subject and then you build upon it and that basic subject forms the foundation of your further knowledge. There are also satellite modules that are sort of freestanding modules that don't necessarily explicitly link into other modules and don't necessarily feed on to other modules or they might feed on to other satellite modules. There's a jigsaw model and this is quite common in medical education for example. You learn about different areas of a subject and hopefully at the end you can the student can piece it all together into one big whole but that can be quite a challenge for students. So it's about there are different approaches also in terms of fitting it all together so you've got a pyramid which is a variation if you like on the satellite model where there are sort of a level one sorry level four subjects and maybe they build on and are prerequisites for the next level up and you need to draw upon those foundational subjects for the next level. Uh, and also the notion of a spiral curriculum and this is very commonly used in school particularly school based science subjects where you revisit concepts at a later stage but you go into maybe more detail or a, a greater uh, understanding of a particular topic. Also worth mentioning finally module specifications I'm sure you've seen them what they include on there and these are all the things we've been talking about the aims these intended learning outcomes there's also obviously the assessment which is crucial and we'll, the learning and teaching strategies and hopefully we've given you lots of different ideas uh, on that already on this program so that's the end of the presentation the reference is there at the end and obviously hopefully you can come along to the session we're going to do some activities and you can come along with maybe some questions or some ideas that you want us to answer or things you want to do 